this talk, Abby originally said, would love to have you talk about quantified self. And I added really the second portion to it, which is what is the emotional layer that we can add on top of quantified self to actually make it actionable and useful. So as we're going through this talk, I'm going to continue to sort of tie back to human emotion and how human emotion really is the reason that we remain healthy, that we change our behavior, and the data just sort of serves to support that. Although the first you know, 20 devices and services I show you um, may not exhibit really strong understanding of human behavior, which I think is a, one of the key issues in, that, in the field right now and something that is a big opportunity going forward. So uh, first, a little bit about myself. Um, I will talk about both companies, Change Collective and Zio, but ultimately I've been in the behavior change, quantified self space since before it was called quantified self. Um, and I'm also advising a bunch of the companies that you'll see in this deck as well. So uh, pretty steeped in it, have a lot of fun thinking about it. And ultimately, what I literally wake up and think about every day is how do I improve my own life, how do I improve the lives of others, and how do I do that through you know, data tracking, behavior science, behavioral psychology. So it's a personal passion of mine. Even if I hadn't done those companies, I'd be reading the books and buying the devices and playing with this stuff. Um, so it, it's a particularly interesting time to be me because we're really jumping into this as a society. And then just general story arc that I'm going to take you guys through starts with sort of what, what did we used to have, right, five years ago, ten years ago before quantified self was really a term, and sort of hearkening back to the fact that we've actually used data as part of our self-improvement practices for, you know, all time. Uh, and, and sort of highlighting some of the ways we did that and how it differs from today. You know, what do we have today? What's what I call sort of quantified self 1.0 look like? And then what's happening either right now, devices or products that you may have seen launch, may not have seen launch, are about to launch. Um, what is really interesting to me, uh, I'm going to talk a lot about smartwatches. I have a very strong opinion that we're going to see computing power moving to the wrist very shortly. I know I'm not alone in that, but there's still a lot of controversy around that. You know, just this morning at the Quantified Self Summit, someone on, on stage was poo-pooing smartwatches and saying the size, size of the smartwatch market will be about as large as the watch market, right? Like if you wear a watch, maybe wear a nicer watch. I think that's not true. And I'd love to talk about why and what I think that's going to do to the world that we live in. And then tying it back to emotions at the end, I'm going to give you some personal stories and also some examples of companies that I think are doing a really good job starting to crack that nut and actually using sort of real psychology, real behavior science to advance this field. And I think that ultimately, if there's one message I could leave you guys with, it's the data is interesting, but using human emotion to add meaning to it is what's really going to add value to all of our lives. So the way that things used to be, right? We, we think that, you know, today if you talk to someone uh, in the QS movement, they, they talk about all these new devices and tracking, and oh my god, we never used to do this. But of course we did, right? We've been measuring weight for a long time. Uh, that's a picture of Ben Franklin's journal. Um, you know, so four or five hundred years ago, meticulous tracking by hand of what he ate, the things he did, how his day went. Um, so it was a very analog process, but we've always used tracking and data as part of our process for changing ourselves and improving our lives. Uh, it was also particularly low resolution. I'm showing here uh, a Daruma doll, I believe it's called. Uh, so I brought this guy into the office recently. Uh, it's a Japanese tradition. And what you do with a Daruma doll, you can see he has one eye. You fill in the first eye when you set a goal. And then you put that on your desk or in your bedroom or wherever until you complete the goal. So you've got a one-eyed doll staring at you. Uh, and it's quite disconcerting. Um, I've had that on my desk for the last few days. I committed to uh, doing a paleo challenge at my CrossFit gym, uh, which is just a, it's sort of a tight interpretation of a paleo diet, very strict. I've never actually successfully completed one. Um, and I said to the team, I'm going to do that. Here's the Daruma doll. I'm going to fill in an eye. Um, and still going through that process. but. That's a good reminder every day. Uh, but it also reminds me that you know, quantified self and tracking used to be pretty low resolution. Right? It was, and still in many of our lives today, you set a goal and then you get the feedback if you achieve it or you don't achieve it. You don't necessarily get extremely detailed feedback along the way that's helping you achieve the goal. So 
we were doing it, it was analog, it was low resolution, and it was also really inaccessible. To a large extent, it still is inaccessible today. Right? Doctor's offices have equipment that we've all seen, we may even, even have been hooked up to once, but how awesome would it be if we could access all that data all the time? I think that's the direction that we're heading as humans and as society. Uh, and they're gonna have, there are gonna be, be, a, be a bunch of implications of that, some positive, some negative, but ultimately, the accessibility of data is becoming much more powerful. But we always, to a large extent, had access to this data if you really had a need for it. We're just now getting it at a much more sort of consumer approachable level. So uh, hence ends the, uh, the nice slide transition. So I'll, I'll, I'll walk through these. Um, the, what I call Gen 1 quantified self devices, of which Zio is a part and I'll go into in a minute, um, you know, Fitbit sort of typifies those guys, but you've got other devices like Garmin, Nike, Polar, um, you know, now a bunch of sort of failed or pseudo-failed devices like Zio and Strive and uh, Fitbug. And all those guys essentially took basic data, which may have been available in some less accessible way, and added connectivity to it. But all super, super basic, right? We're talking about step tracking, heart rate for athletes, and that's it. Right? That's essentially the data that you get from these devices. And if you think about like the, the rich amount of data that fills our lives, our stress, our mood, our hydration, our happiness, none of that, right? Super simple. Um, and very limited use cases, right? So you've got walking and running. Those are literally the two use cases that data is particularly useful for even today, right? Anything else, you're really less likely to be using data as a meaningful part of your change practice. Uh, but if you're walking, you, know, you now have really great tools from devices to phones to help you really get a count on steps and increase them every day. And if you're an athlete, you're really getting a lot of great work out of Garmin, Polar, and uh, similar devices. Uh, and then last but not least, fundamentally, you know, that's, this is a picture from a Jawbone device and from a Withings device. Um, it was mostly just data. It still is mostly just data. And you know, the, the best the sort of that we've done beyond that is a good social layer that allows you to share it, that allows you to sort of get commentary on that data. Um, and just with this, there's value, right? There were, you know, north of, I forget the exact numbers, but you know, Fitbit probably did well over a million units last year um, and is growing like crazy as a company. Um, Jawbone and Nike are doing similar numbers. So even with just these limited use cases, tons of uptake, tons of interest. So for me, that shows sort of what's coming down the pike as we add a lot more data sources and as we add a lot more meaning to this. Um, so before I go to the next slide, I would love to have this be interactive from like now through the end, rather than like me talking at you for the next 45 minutes and then like handing over the mic. So um, I'm just going to throw some random questions out here in the next one or two slides. Uh, and Abby's got some, um, some head or microphones. So before I flip the next slide, who's heard of Zio before? All right. Um, do you want to give me your impressions of Zio? Honest impressions. <laughs> <clears throat> totally failed company. No emotion involved here. <laughs> while, while I used it, uh, I would often wake up with it no longer on my head. Uh, mm -hmm. So that at first was disappointing. Um, and then I never quite found the data to be that useful, and so I stopped using it, and it stayed okay. on a shelf. Anyone else? Cool. I love the tough love. That's exactly what I was expecting. You delivered it. <laughs> um, we could have gotten somewhere who loved it. I mean, there are people who are still using it or begging me for headbands. Um, I'm going to give you the quick story of Zio. Zio, uh, you'll see it in a moment. It's a sleep tracking headband. Um, we were convinced in 2003 that everyone was going to wear a headband to sleep because it was so awesome. And we were convinced initially because of a feature we called Smart Wake. Smart Wake helps you wake up at the right time so that you feel less sleep inertia. Sleep inertia is the grogginess that you feel when you get up. So you know, if I woke you up from a deep slumber and handed you a phone you know, with you know, someone answering questions, you'd be like, uh, uh, what? What's going on? And that sort of feeling of grogginess can actually last for quite some time. So we dug into the books and we figured out the right time to wake you up. And then we spent four years before putting this on anyone's head. 
because we were that scared of customer feedback. Uh, spent over a million dollars. At this point, it was mostly just the founders, a handful of employees. We'd come out of uh, Brown University. Um, and I mention all of that because when we actually produced uh, this device, um, and I'll, I'll flip back to it, we handed it out to 20 folks in a focus group. And at that time, the device was essentially focused on waking you up at the right time. So you would set your alarm at 7 a.m. It would wake you between 6.30 and 7 at the right time to minimize sleep inertia. Um, I used to pitch it by saying, how would you like to wake up after just four hours of sleep and feel like you slept eight hours? How many people would like that? Right. It was an easy pitch. How much would you pay for that? I would pay anything. <laughs> Turns out you can't actually do that. <laughs> wow. wow. Um, but you know, literally, we spent years developing this technology and never actually waking someone up at the right time. So it's like startup feedback loop number one, you know, customer feedback, complete fail. Uh, we waited until we had 20 of those units, had spent a million dollars on it, we're three years in, until we actually gave them out to a bunch of people who are not us and said, how do you feel when you woke up? And the feedback was not good. It was 20 people in a room of which 12 or 13 said, well, why would I wake up early? That doesn't make any sense. What I need to do is sleep more. And then like four or five who were like, eh, I sort of felt a difference. And then like one or two who were like, I loved it. It was amazing, right? Which is much worse than chance. Uh, so, <laughs> and, but believe it or not, it still took us six months to a year from that feedback to switch the product in the direction that it landed, which was, when we gave that product to people, the, the display on the front that you see of that device shows REM sleep, shows deep sleep, shows light sleep. It is still the most sophisticated consumer sleep measurement device that has ever existed. And we launched it in 2009. And people in that focus group, even though they didn't really enjoy the wake up, they loved the data. And they pointed at the data and they said, how do I get more deep sleep? How do I get more REM sleep? Why did I wake up so many times? Insistent questioning around how they could improve their sleep. So we shifted the device focus towards sleep quality. And this is at the same time that the quantified self movement was really coming of age. And so I don't know when the, the term was first tossed around. It was uh, mentioned by Gary Wolf, probably in a maybe 2005 or 2006 Wired article talking about uh, the Nike Plus device, which at that time was like a physical pod that you put in your shoe that you ran with your iPod, if anyone remembers iPods. Um, so the quantified self was like, in its nascency, and we were like, oh wow, this is sort of what we are. Right? And there's other companies sort of doing this thing. Um, so in 2009, we launched that device. We sold it for $400. Um, and we got an amazing turnout from some pretty interesting folks like the Wall Street Journal and the Today Show and David Pogue, all raving about it with a tiny mini point of they didn't really like the headband. Um, and we ignored that as well. So we had launched this device. We'd gotten tons of great feedback. We we're starting to sell them like crazy. We raised another $12 million, hired a CEO, hired a full team, off to the races, go, 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 go. Um, and then in two, sort of from the 2007 to 2009 period, if anyone remembers, the iPhone launched. And suddenly we were caught with this device, physical alarm clock, that just so clearly should have been a phone that you were almost hitting yourself on the head, but also realized that we'd started developing this device in 2004, 2005, well before the iPhone really existed. Uh, but we reacted, albeit slowly, and in 2010, 2011, developed and launched the Zio Mobile. So the, the way that we thought of this was, look, we did a really good job on Zio bedside. We sold like $3 million worth of that in a year. You know, in order to make this go up and to the right, what do we need to do? Customers are complaining about five things. Maybe it's four, we'll see. One, they don't want the data, they want the data more connected. So the, the original device, uh, there's actually an SD card, you can see it in the side, that you pulled over to your computer. And like, how dumb is that? So I want the data more connected. They said, I want it connected to my phone. They said, I don't want to pay $400 for it, I want to pay much less than that. Um, they also said, we don't like the headband. So essentially we said, we can eliminate three out of four of their problems. That's 75% of problems removed. Let's do that. So we spent another $12 million. We developed Zio Mobile. We launched it in 2011.
We got a ton of press. Everyone is excited about it. Sales quadrupled. Revenue, however, as you can see, stayed about the same. Um, and at the same time as this was happening, in 2010, 2011, Fitbit was taking off like a rocket. So Fitbit had launched six months after us, right? Completely different device. It was a physical, you know what Fitbit is, right? It tracks physical motion primarily. Sleep is a byproduct sort of side thing. But Fitbit had gone from like 2 million now to probably 300 million or more in revenue. And they were on that ramp curve. And we were trying to get on that ramp curve. And we were spending, 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 releasing that new product to try and get there. Right. That was eventually what happened to Zio, um, but it took, as you can see, almost eight, nine years to do that. Uh, but in 2012, um, I'd left actually in 2011, company shut down in 2012, and it's that picture. Right? I got that picture off some guy's blog who said, uh, you know, most invasive device ever, essentially. <laughs> right? Like, ah, I've tried all these things, and like, here's the one that's the most invasive, right there. Uh, and we'd taken a bunch of like glamour shots of people wearing headbands, but I think this one ultimately is the one that sort of wins out uh, on the day. But ultimately, I mean, tons of great lessons learned as an entrepreneur. You know, what I think we should take away from it is there are a small number of people in this world who are willing to do almost anything to get data, especially when you're first. There are a very, those are a very small number of people. There are a very large number of people that can and will use data in a very different way that's much more passive and much more integrated into their lifestyle. And I think that's what we're seeing today with some of the, the products that I'm going to show you. Uh, so let me, let me pause for any questions on Zio or thoughts, anything anyone was dying to ask on Zio? Edwina, do you have any questions? Just out of curiosity, from the success that the Sleep Cycle app has had thus far, what learnings have you been able to capture from that? Yeah, uh, I remember when our CEO stood up in front of the company, he held his smartphone up after Sleep Cycle launched and he said, this is not good data. It's not as good as our data. They're never going to go anywhere. That was wrong. <laughs> Right, so, um, I th and we eventually launched our own sleep cycle competitor, it was called Sleep 101, um, so got on that train as well. Ultimately, I think what we took away from it is that data quality exists on a continuum along with comfort and usability. And you can't, if you crank data quality all the way up and you lose, on lose usability, you don't have a useful thing. Right? And often the solutions that have shittier data quality but are better integrated into people's lives are the ones that are going to win. And I think, so we're seeing that again and again and again, right? Consumer preference is comfort or convenience, number one, data quality, number two. So sleep cycle is exactly that, right? The data quality is pretty shitty, but it's cost zero dollars and can be used in a single night. And as such, has gotten a ton of traction. I was curious if you, what your conversations are like in terms of switching markets, going from an entirely consumer-facing approach to maybe something, a different market, maybe more clinically oriented, yeah. where invasiveness is accepted because it's just the uh, nature of the, that maybe a diagnostic yeah. approach. Yeah, we, we thought long and hard about creating Zio as a, either a sleep apnea type product or as a diagnosis and treatment for insomnia. Right, so you go to the doctor's office, right now insomnia is literally a questionnaire that says, do you not sleep well? <laughs> if you say yes, you have insomnia. And then they send you home with a prescription medication, after which you come back and they say, how are you sleeping? And that's how you're determining how useful that medication was. So it's completely non-quantified. Um, I still think that's a very valuable market. Ultimately, what we decided is that the company that we built and the people that we put in it were, not cons were consumer product folks not medical device guys, right? And no amount of wrangling would have really made that true. So at any point, it would have been a complete company restart. Um, there are things that we, I think we would do differently, of course, in this story, and I'll, I'll describe what some of those are, but going to a medical market is not really one of them. You know, the original vision was to help people in the real world improve their sleep, and a product that was on the clinical track, um, just, I have zero interest in building clinical products and going through FDA clearance and working with doctors. Like, 
it's wonderful and there's problems to be solved there. It's just not my wheelhouse. So you know, that's sort of the basis that we made the decision on. But it was a constant discussion. Great. All right. What stopped you from going in the direction of Fitbit or moving to like a, a wearable bracelet, that kind of thing? Yeah. So we, when we, when we launched uh, Zio Mobile or when we were thinking about Zio Mobile, essentially there were three directions we were thinking about going. We were thinking about launching Zio Mobile, which is essentially like take the product that we already have that people love and fix the problems that people have with it, except for the fundamental fact that they don't like it. Um, <laughs> In retrospect, but like, of course, that's not the way that we thought about it. Um, you know, option number two was what you're suggesting: go after the larger fitness market uh, rather than being a sleep device. Right? Weight loss and nutrition and exercise are just bigger opportunities. Um, let's go after those. And uh, one of our competitor companies, a company called Lark, did that. They went from a sleep bracelet to a life bracelet, and now they're not selling it anymore. So. No, not a win. Um, and ultimately, I think that was a calculation based on, again, the DNA that we built the company around was the sleep company, it's a sleep company, it's a sleep company, it's a sleep company. We have sleep scientists on our board. Like, it starts with a Z. It was sleep, 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 sleep all the time. The last direction that we thought about going was a non-invasive sleep sensor. Right? So a sensor that was in your mattress, on your mattress, next to your mattress. I studied all of them. I suggested that we, at some point, that we build one. Um, and in fact, before the company eventually did die, we were building one. We were building a mattress-based sensor. We had you know, close to ink deals with major, major mattress manufacturers to integrate that sensor into those mattresses. We're going to release our own product. And you'll see some companies that uh, I'm advising are doing that now. So it's a bit of a, it's shitty, right? It's shitty that we didn't get there sooner. Because I still think that is going to be the direction that sleep takes. And I think a big, valuable company that helps a lot of people is going to be built on it. Cool. So I'm going to jump into what I'm calling sort of generation two quantified self devices. So if generation one was basically activity data and you know, one or two outliers, um, we're now seeing a massive proliferation of these types of quantified self devices. And they're measuring almost everything. So I'm just going to go through some of the ones I know uh, are out there or are soon to be out there, starting with Sculpt. So Sculpt uses impedance. Uh, you can sort of see under uh, or right above that guy's arm uh, little metal bands. So they have, a, uh, I think it's 16 electrodes, and they measure electrical impedance between each electrode and then use an algorithm to detect mus muscle quality. This is a group of folks who developed that technology uh, for muscular dystrophy and other sort of neurogenitive diseases, and then said, what if we use this in fitness to help people develop muscles and get thin and get, you know, sort of jump into the quantified self market? Uh, has done really well. So those guys raised uh, 250K on Indiegogo about six months ago, are in the process of building, producing, launching that device. And you can literally just put it on your arm, measure muscle quality and fat percentage. Put it on your leg, put it on your leg, do that, and if you change your workout routine, you can see changes immediately. Uh, they're also looking at whether that can be used as a post-workout recovery measurement. right? So your muscle quality before your workout and after your workout changes in various ways that could indicate whether you work too hard, when you should work out next, build up in, in different sort of waste products. So pretty sophisticated device. Um, you know, has clear applications in like athletics and sort of high-end stuff, but could also be the type of product that uh, people trying to lose weight or just sort of head to the gym more could use. Um, MC10, a uh, great local company. On the right, on the right, yeah, on the right you see sort of their, uh, what they hope will be their final generation sensor or closer to it. That's actually skin and those are electronics on the skin. So they have, they've built a uh, heart rate sensor and uh, a, light, a photo sensor and you know, an LED all into a patch that goes in your skin. So it's sort of like a wearable electronic. At some point, this could advance to the point where it's a peel and stick. And you know, eventually, you need to replace it, but pretty powerful technology. Um, that is years off. Um, what you see on the left is a product that they built with Reebok that's on the market right now. That's a sensor that's used for detecting um, impact in football games. So that K 
cap with electronics is placed on uh, beneath a, a football helmet, and when you smash your head against someone else, it will let you know how hard you smashed it. Um, <laughs> this is how I feel about football. But <laughs> um, so very cool company, local, doing some great stuff, and like actually has a product on the market. Um, Bedit is the company I mentioned that has a great mattress pad sensor. So I have one of these on my bed right now. That strip is a piezoelectric strip, very sensitively measures movement under your chest and comes up with respiration, heart rate, movement. Can get a little bit of heart rate variability in there as well and then stages your sleep. So it's, it's not the data quality of Zio, but it's pretty damn good and you don't have to wear the headband. So my prediction is that product or something very much like it will take off and will make sleep a much more quantifiable event. Um, even the devices that are wrist-based today, like a Jawbone or a Fitbit, people tend to not wear them to sleep. Or they, if they do, it's a novelty event, right? They're like, oh, I'm going to track my sleep, right? And they wear it, and then they realize they don't want to wear this thing to bed all the time because it's a pain in the ass to wear to bed all the time. Uh, and it needs to charge. There's all sorts of logistical issues with it. Um, they just don't do it. And the data quality from the wrist is pretty shitty as well. That data quality is better than a Fitbit or a Jawbone. It's not quite as good as a Zio. Um, and it's a install on the bed and automatically go up to your phone. So really powerful technology. Uh, they raised 500K on Indiegogo in maybe June, last June approximately, and still have not released a product, but are close. So that one should be out soon. Uh, Sunsprite, another uh, interesting local company. So Sunsprite measures your sun exposure. And it does it uh, not for the purposes of sort of UV and sun prevention, but rather to make sure you get enough sun. Right? Seasonal affective disorder, depression, mood, energy, all these things are related to sunlight. So if anyone has ever felt like after a week under the clouds in the spring in Boston that you're kind of pissed off, uh, it could be due to sun exposure. Um, and of course, we now live in a world where you, know, you wake up you run to the office and you sit under fluorescent lights all day and then you leave work and sit under fluorescent lights when it's dark outside. So we're just not getting the sun exposure our bodies are used to. Sunsprite, uh, that's a device that clips on using a magnet, um, has solar cells to measure, also charges using solar cells so it never needs to charge, and then goes Bluetooth to the phone and shows you on the left um, how much sun, sun exposure you, you've had during the day and then sort of nudges you and reminds you to do things that'll get you more sun exposure. So um, expecting that to be a pretty interesting product, especially for anyone in northern latitude. Right? Florida, probably not so interesting. But uh, New York, Boston, Seattle, you know, Finland, great product. Um, Inside Tracker. So Inside Tracker is a blood analysis company for consumers. So their process you see on the left, blood draw, they check the results, run it through an algorithm, give you the result on the right. Um, and it's a much more valuable version of what you would otherwise have to go to a doctor and get a number from. And so if you went to your doctor, literally they would only give you information about it if it was in the red range. What Inside Tracker will do is they look at where your optimal range is as a human, but also in your age range, are you working out a lot, and tell you what you should do to change that level, either using supplementation, exercise, or um, food intake. So a uh, very cool product, still does require the barrier of blood from the arm. So it falls, to, you know, from my perspective, squarely into the category of a Zio and that it's gonna have limited market adoption until they figure out how to do blood analysis in a different way. Um, they recently released a product that uh, just uses a finger prick of blood. Still blood though, right? You have to prick your finger and milk it and get the blood on the thing and uh, send it back to them. But um, we will have a world not so long from now where you don't have to do all those crazy things in order to get some of this data. And I'll show you some of the companies that are working on it. Uh, Athos. Um, this is a company that makes a shirt that measures EMG. Um, so they claim to have been able to take EMG technology uh, which is a muscle measurement um, and drop it into a shirt to be used for workouts so that you can see what your muscle effort is at at any given workout. So this could be used for any sort of training, although I don't know why you would use it for yoga, um, which is what they're showing it for, but for strength training, for um, any sort of uh, you know, CrossFit style running, really interesting data uh, could come out of that. This one I would, I would put in the 
pretty far from market, a little bit tech dream right now, uh, but I think they're making good progress against it. Uh, Melon, again, another headband. Uh, this one uh, measures brainwaves while you're awake and helps you become more alert, work on focus, productivity. Um, love the guys who are doing this, love the idea. I think they're going to face, again, Zio-like challenges where wearing a headband is a challenge. People don't want to do it. You need to give them a lot of benefit before they're willing to wear a headband. Uh, but successfully funded on Kickstarter, um, in the process of manufacturing, so we'll see how Melon does. Uh, but at the very least, it'll be an interesting specialty tool, and maybe they'll find a mass market application for it. Uh, Sano Intelligence. So Sano uses, I, I couldn't find a picture because they're super stealth, but I'll tell you what they're doing as far as I know, which is um, a patch that uses uh, microderm needles to measure uh, essentially the metabolites that will reach sort of close, not getting deep into the blood, but sort of the top couple layers of skin. So they can get uh, things that relate to like potassium levels and um, other sort of hydration related things. Um, so hydration is something they can work on. Um, they tend to not get the stuff that are sort of larger molecules that are still require blood. But one can imagine a patch like that in the future getting closer and closer to getting something like a full blood diagnostic with a patch that's continuous on your arm, which would be a major breakthrough. Um, and then I think last in this section, um, are you guys, how familiar are you guys with the Apple M7 coprocessor? Cool. Uh, so the Apple M7 coprocessor is actually a pretty fucking big deal. And it's a big deal because I think it, it's, a, it's a hat tip in the direction that Apple is heading. So the Apple M7 coprocessor has essentially taken the accelerometer uh, gyroscope compass from their sort of normal use and dropped into a coprocessor that can run at extremely low power. So instead of what used to happen, which is if you were going to track motion from your phone, you have to worry about your battery life dying suddenly you don't have to worry about that. And apps like Human uh, and Argus and numerous other ones have tapped that data so that essentially step data, activity data, is completely free. It's accessible in your phone. Um, Fitbit is going to have to massively adjust to this because I'm still not sure why people would wear a wristband when the same data or similar data is coming out of their phone already. Um, and the reason I mention it as a hat tip in the direction that Apple is heading is that this is useful for a phone. It's much more useful for a watch. And I'll, I'll give you some, some of my thoughts at, at where I think that's heading in the future. Um, and the app on the right, Human, Human actually is a very interesting application where instead of just being a step tracker that says, you know, you're going to set this many steps, um, you know, how many did you make today? Is it 1,000? Is it 10,000? They bring that and like, I don't know about you, but I don't really know how many steps is good or bad. I, I sort of know that 10,000 might be good, but I don't really know how many that is. And sometimes I bike. Uh, what human does is they measure how many minutes of activity you had during a day and say that you should have more than 30. So it's super simple. Like anyone can understand, like you should move for 30 minutes a day. That's it. And they use real human emotional stuff to get you to move 30 minutes a day and have really been successful in using that sort of core based data to actually drive human behavior. So if you're interested, I, I would really suggest checking out human. Um, and this one, uh, so the health book, this is a rumor of what will be in iOS 8. Uh, so essentially there was a leak, um, 9 to 5 Mac reported on the health book as a feature of the next uh, Mac o iOS uh, release. And so what HealthBook, literally all we've seen of this is this screenshot. So, um, you know, if, if we're going to guess at it, here's what I would guess. Um, you know, there, there should be a central place for data. Apple is very likely creating it and calling it HealthBook, just like Passbook, where they are trying to get your movie tickets and your uh, airline tickets and all these other things. Um, I would guess that HealthBook is, is forming a similar role, and this is, you know, this is not my original thought process. There are a bunch of people who have looked at that screenshot and said, if that's true, here's what we think. Um, and that right, activity stuff and sort of some base stuff would come in through your phone. Um, but some of those things, like 
the diabetes, I think, is on there, blood sugar. Right? That's not going to come in through your phone. That's going to come in through some third-party device, but be integrated with HealthBook so all the data is stored there centrally. Um, so in addition to being sort of a hat tip to where they're heading, I think what, if this is true, one of the reasons it's really important is that it would make data fundamentally much more accessible. It would also make it owned by Apple. Right? So it's like it's a, it's a double-edged sword. Like, I would love to have access to that, right? Because what we're building at Change Collective, which you'll see, um, basically, if anyone had any data and they let me use it, we would be able to use it to improve the quality of our advice and our courses and our program. Um, it also scares me terribly that all of our health data is going to be in HealthBook. Um, but I think it will because I think they're doing it, one, and I think it'll be really convenient and useful for developers, and as a result, we'll use it. And if it has good enough privacy around it, I think we'll sort of stomach the challenge around Apple having that data and give it to them. But we'll see. Um, so before I, before I go on to there, um, questions on any of those devices, or if you've seen other devices in the market, either mention them, or if you have questions about them, I can see if I know them. Mm -hmm. Are many of these without <coughs> FDA approval in sort of um, the different um, brands that... Uh... Yeah. So the, essentially the requirements, first of all, it's still a gray area, but the requirements for FDA approval, the question was, do these devices or others have FDA approval or are they consumer? Um, ultimately it comes down to, does it um, in some way interact with you in a way that requires it? Like. Uh, taking blood, right? there's a physical requirement that that be a medical device, or does it dispense medically re relevant information? Right? So you can take the same piece of data and say, um, you should move more and be a healthier person, or you can say, you should move more in order to have your congestive heart failure you know, alleviated. And one of those is a piece of information that's completely consumer, there's no FDA involved, the other is FDA regulated, you have to go through, you know, the standard pretty onerous processes. Um, I'll just go through them and, and, and say that's all consumer. Uh, that is uh, very likely to require FDA clearance because it uh, has microneedles. Um, that is consumer. That's consumer. Um, that they actually rely upon blood work that's done by labs. Um, so all their blood work stuff is FDA cleared. But once it gets to the analysis stage, because they're just making health-related advice, they, they don't clear that. So it's sort of a tweener. Um, consumer, consumer, um, I don't know, consumer. So most of it is staying on the consumer side. Um, at Zio, we decided to stay on the consumer side. Essentially, we, we felt like we had the choice. Um, and we chose to go on the consumer side and very happy that we did that. No one ever slapped our hand. Um, and we think at least the, the devices that were released in that era established a precedent that like, oh, cool, it's okay to use this type of data for like health-related stuff without the FDA uh, jumping on it. Does it has, um, does the data have the same quality? Um, well, I, I do have a Fitbit and mm -hmm. it was a sleep analysis. They told me I was waking up throughout the night, yeah. but I think I was only moving. So yeah. Um, I mean, it depends, right? And it, it's more a function of the data source rather than it being medical or not, right? Like, there are pedometers that are medical quality that have similar accuracy, um, you know, specifically related to the wrist-based trackers. Um, my personal opinion is they're quite good at determining when you're awake. They're, they're okay at determining whether you're asleep, but of course it's using motion. And the ones that are putting light sleep and deep sleep on there are effectively uh, lying to us. Right? They're, they're essentially, like when we released a product called Sleep 101, which used motion, we called it uh, more restful or sort of more, uh, less restful or more restful, which we felt was sort of a fair representation because if you're moving around a lot during sleep, it does correlate um, with being more restless, but it doesn't actually correlate with deep sleep, which is a specific brainwave state, et cetera, et cetera. So it sounds like, I mean, you guys took about eight, nine years to develop your hardware. There's a lot more apps or other hardware doing it faster these days. Yeah. Do you think it's, is it the iPhone that's what kind of prompted it? And also are there, in the future, are there any other technologies, like Google Glass or other things like that, platforms that yeah. will allow other growth? 
Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So uh, the, the I'll answer the first one first, and the second is sort of in the in, in the embedded in the rest of the presentation. But the question is, why is it why did it take us so goddamn long to, to launch Zio, um, and why can people do it faster today, and will it be faster in the future? Um, we were so we were super slow, right? We really got working on it in 2004. The product came out in 2009, so five years. Why was that? Reason number one is we were students, didn't have any money, and didn't know what the fuck we were doing. So just that simple. Like we had no idea. So we were six months from launch all the time. <laughs> from day one, we were six months from launch. We put dashboards, like uh, we put uh, countdowns above our doors that would go down, 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 and they get reset. Down, 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 and get reset. So we just, we didn't know what we were doing until quite a bit further into the process. Once we figured it out, once we were like, OK, here's what product development really is like, and we have the money to do it, et cetera, it was more like a two and a half year product, um, which is not unreasonable. I think the folks who are doing it today at speed are doing it in maybe 18 months from soup to nuts. Most products still take 24 months or a little bit longer if you're a first generation product to cook. Um, there are tons of new techniques today that make hardware a lot easier. Right? There's a bunch of development that can be done off standard boards. There's, you know, 3D printing has gotten way better. A friend of mine has a device where he literally just 3D prints the new model almost every day until they get it right. Um, so there's a, and there's just a better ecosystem around it. There's a better funding ecosystem. So uh, it's much more reasonable today to think about building a hardware device and shipping it in 12 to 18 months. Uh, but it still takes most people longer than that. And then we'll get later to what I think is going to happen coming forward. There's a one behind you, Abby. Uh, there was one of these products, I think it was Moon Melon, Melon yep. something that you said works on your brain during the day. And the bad thing is that it requires this headband, but that yep. it helps you focus or measure focus. Does that mean it would help people with ADD? Uh, or there, just generally focus? So Melon is not going after ADHD or ADD, but there has been good research done that shows that neurofeedback uh, can work for ADHD and ADD, and it's a, I think, I believe it's actually a, a reasonably well accepted treatment for that. So one could do that, and then there are a couple companies that are. Uh, but fundamentally, a similar principle is being used by Mellon in the consumer realm to help you focus and sort of get into the zone. So they're measuring, uh, you know, brainwave activity, EEG, and determining, um, you know, based on ratios of various bands, and then giving you feedback where you are and then where you should be heading. So it gives well, it gives you some some exercises that can be done to get in focus, right? So you can do things like uh, breathing, um, relaxation, meditation. Um, there are other sort of brainwave entrainment things that you know it is not as much science behind, like binaural beats or other sort of uh, transcranial direct current stimulation, which I don't believe they have, but you could have that could all sort of impact that system. So. Um, all those things are, are sort of possible. Um, there, and there have been headsets like NeuroSky for a while that have done some things with focus. It clearly sort of works, but it doesn't work well enough that like we're all wearing headbands to focus while working. And I don't know if it ever will. We'll see. Is there one more over here? Yeah, go for it. Is there anything you know of like that's promising on tracking passively calories in, so nutritional? Anything yeah. Yeah. So um, there. Uh, so the company I know that actually has made the most progress in this has not gotten a lot of press on it. It's a company called Philometron, uh, and they make a patch that goes sort of abdominally, measures things like uh, heart rate and hydration and uh, uh, movement and a couple other measures, and then sort of backs into caloric intake. Um, they have claimed that it's as accurate as a food log. Uh, food logs are not very accurate, right? Like when you write down like three quarters of a Cortland apple, <laughs> it's just not very good. So you don't have to be great in order to get to the level of a food diary. Um, but I haven't seen that product actually in action on the market, so I can't really say. Um, and then there's been a lot of noise recently about a recent device on the wrist. I forget the name of it. Um, if anyone remembers it, what's the name of it? 
mm, it's not new meter. There's a there's an Indiegogo campaign going on right now for someone who claims to be able from the wrist to measure caloric intake, and it's a bunch of basically like Russian brain scientists and like. A bunch of people are backing them, and a bunch of people are saying, like, this is crazy bullshit. So we'll see. <laughs> but it should be possible to get a proxy for it at the right time. Yeah. Uh, if big companies like Apple and Google is really going to release those kind of data center and make ways to analyze data, those data, is it going to influence how you invent those kind of devices? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll get right into that because I, I think it. I think they are, uh, and I think it will because you're going to be less reliant on only having a single data source or creating that data source yourself, and you're more likely to have data available from multiple devices as we go forward. These are all very creative solutions to problems that strike me as. Uh, niche products for the quantified self first. So I wonder, what's your outlook on how or when, if these products will ever make it mainstream? And will they do it on their own, or are there uh, value chain partners that yep. need to be there t for distribution? Yep, cool. I will answer that by going on to the next slide, uh, which is smartwatches. So um, I have a very strong personal opinion on smartwatches, which I will transmit to you. Um, you know, take it with a grain of salt, because none of this stuff has really happened yet. But from my perspective, the history of computing is one of processing power and interaction with the computer moving closer and closer to us uh, to the point where uh, we're going to have some pretty wild and amazing technologies in not so long. So you know, mainframes enabled, you know, enabled computing for mostly big business uses, right? No one has a mainframe sitting at their home. Uh, you know, the PC enabled actual personal use of it, and the killer app there was word processing, right, uh, essentially. Uh, I think the killer app on a phone, because it's with you, is social. I think that if you look at the vast majority of like, the value that's been created, like all of, you know, during each of these eras, other things happen, right? Like gaming happened, and social happened on the, on the desktop, but like the big breakout, I think, for mobile phones was social. And I think what's coming next is a smartwatch. I'll describe why I think that. And I think the big breakthrough on a smartwatch is going to be health, because you go from something that's with you to on you. And you radically transform the amount of data that you can get and what you can do with it. Um, so you know, today, smartwatches are really in their infancy. So probably the three most prominent today are Pebble, which is a e-paper display. Uh, they shipped 400,000 of those last year. Tiny number compared to smartphones, but freaking gargantuan for a startup. Um, Basis just got bought by Intel for somewhere between 100 and $150 million. Basis essentially is a pretty crappy display with a heart rate sensor on the other side that can give you live heart rate information uh, from the wrist. Um, and then Android Wear was just announced two weeks ago. So Google announced that they had ported Android over to wearables built a really intuitive card-based system that surfaces the information that's relevant to you at that moment where you are, and that partners like Motorola and others uh, were releasing smartwatches with Android Wear as part of them. Um, no, one, you know, no one has actually seen an Android Wear watch in the, live, uh, watch in the world yet. Right? It's essentially just a Google commercial, uh, but we can expect to see those. I believe the Motorola device said they were shipping by, I think it was June or July, so we'll see whether that happens. But very shortly to happen. Um, and ultimately, like a lot of people are going to ask, um, you know, Google Glass has been around for a while, why not Glass? And this will sort of transfer into my argument for why, why the wrist. Um, you know, the ultimate evolution of this stuff, um, from my perspective, is bestified by there's a, a sci fi novel called Nexus, which is, uh, I forget the author, Daniel Suarez, was it? Or does anyone remember the name of the author from Nexus? Might be Daniel Suarez. Um, Nexus essentially describes um, a ingestible computer that travels to your brain, interfaces with your neurons, and you can run an operating system on top of your brain. And you can send that operating system details like, calm me down now, or 
um, give me social skills now, or um, give me uh, you know, traffic data. And you literally are just directly interfacing with a computer in your brain, right? Super sci-fi, but ultimately, like to me, that's the ultimate, uh, you know, when you think about computing power moving from a mainframe to a desktop, to a laptop, to a smartphone, to a smartwatch, to something in you. Right? That's the ultimate evolution of this, where computing power is on display, on demand, without anyone, you know, any friction. Uh, you're interfacing that computer with your thoughts without any friction. Like, imagine what you could do with that um, if it actually happened. And you know, the next, so the question is, if that might be where we're headed, God knows how many years from now, what's the next logical step, right, from a smartphone towards that sort of like merger of human and computer? And you know, the two leading candidates for it today are smartwatches or glass type systems. And uh, my belief pattern is essentially that the benefit from going from a smartwatch to glass is persistent display, right? The watch could be here and you have to turn it over, right? This display is always in your field of vision. The downside is the terrible social inconvenience of Google Glass, right? There is as it's not a very human interface, it doesn't mean it won't happen eventually, but you know, Google can try and make it really cool by putting it on a model. However, it's a very non-human thing to be staring at someone that's wearing Google Glass, if anyone's ever done it, if anyone's ever worn Google Glass, is a very jarring experience. Um, you know, watches, on the other hand, we've worn watches for a millennia. Um, looking at a watch is a fairly acceptable social gaffe. And you get most of the benefit that you get from glass by going to a watch. Right? You get the benefit, let's see what the next slide is here. Yeah, you get the benefit of having a display at the wrist at all times so that you get notifications around weather, you get notifications around traffic, email, texting, communications, health, without having to go anywhere. And then from a health impact, what happens when you do that, when you have a general computing platform on the wrist? Right. The smartphone, from a health perspective, all it could really give us was location and movement. Right. A smartwatch can give us, from a sort of base signals perspective, eventually blood pressure, heart rate, heart rate variability, galvanic skin response, oxygen saturation, temperature, psh, 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 the list goes on. You can get quite a lot because you've physically gone from here to here. Right. I, I can add to that list respiration. Like There are so much that you can get from being in the body, right? And if you think long term about things like sono intelligence, right, you can get some blood markers from being on the wrist. You can get a lot. And that can translate to, instead of what location and movement translates to, which is just activity, you get sleep, stress, emotions, hydration, nutrition, all this amazing stuff. So a lot of a lot of services will enhance themselves, I think, when we have smartwatches. So if you if you believe that we'll have smartwatches and they'll be on a lot of wrists. You know, Yelp will get better by being on the wrist, right? Your email will get better because it's on the wrist, but that it'll be a relatively incremental difference, right? But from a health perspective, it will not be incremental, right? The health and wellness apps that we have on our phone today are going to look absolutely archaic compared to what will happen when we have persistent quality data sources on the wrist, right? Today, how many people, uh, let's do, do a quick poll, how many people have for the last 30 days activity data? Okay, how many have sleep data? So it was like 40 hands, now 10 hands. How many have any other type of data? Okay, four or five hands, right? So if, if you were to do an overlap of all of those, right, essentially you're not getting any overlap, right? Like doing the cool shit that you want to do, like when you don't sleep, your exercise is bad the next day, and then you're angry to your mother. Right? Like, we've been talking about that stuff for a long time as a possibility. You can't do that even close today. Right? Smartwatches will get us much closer to that and in a very short time frame. That doesn't require us to, to go all the way to implantables or ingestibles or things that are sort of super sci-fi. So I think it's going to make a big difference in the next few years. Uh, if I had to guess, you know, that's, a, that's someone's you know, janky picture of an iWatch. Um, you know, of course, it's not the real picture of the iWatch. but um, all signs point to Apple being uh, working on an iWatch. Um, if I had to be a gambling man, I would say that is probably slated for late 2014, maybe early 2014, 15. 
Although just like the Zio launch, I said that last year, so <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but it's, I, I don't think it's going to be long, right? Uh, the Android Wear just started gaining steam. We're going to see some really interesting stuff on the wrist. Um, it's going to be niche for a bit, but I think the adoption curve on this stuff is going to be faster than tablets. And tablets went from like zero to in most households in a matter of years. Um, so let me pause there again before I jump into the emotional side to it uh, for a bunch of questions. So um, this watch, um, uh, I'm wondering what it compare, what the technology for wearable patches, how that mm. compares to, I, I don't think this is a prototype, <laughs> it looks, looks like an iPhone <laughs> melted down and <Yeah. laughs> rolled up. <laughs> but uh, so um, I know uh, MIT la uh, Media Lab is developing wearable patches. Yeah. Is that technology advanced enough to be somehow in competition with this? Um, you know. I don't really know, but I, I don't really think so. I think that the wearable patch stuff, I mean, you can, you can do wearable patches, right? Body Media, uh, I don't know if they've released it yet, but they've developed a wearable patch for the Body Media device, which has uh, four sensors, accelerometer, GSR, et cetera, and does some really good caloric measurement. Um, there are you know, other companies like Philometron, that Philometron has an ingestible um, well, so they, they add a, uh, a technology to pills so that they know when, they, when you ingest them based on a patch that's next to them. So you ingest a pill, that pill transmits to the patch, transmits to your smartphone that you took the pill. Um, so there are applications today that are either commercial or close to commercial, but I don't think that like, I don't think it's a replacement in terms of like social utility for something that's on the wrist um, in terms of like a mass consumer opportunity right now. You had a question? Yes, so uh, I know that some people are uh, concerned that, um, you know, as, as we get more and more of this wearable, we are kind of more and more distracted. And it's very common today to see um, people going with the uh, watch and iPhone, and then suddenly everything starts ringing and uh, blinking. Um, well, hold on, hold on, I gotta. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the question is do you think that? manufacturers of uh, these type of devices are actually going to do something uh, to kind of reduce concerns from that angle, yeah. which are kind of contradicting uh, the whole idea, but yeah. but might kind of uh, backfire. Um, so I don't know that they're going to solve it. I think the direction that, so as an example, in the Android Wear scenario, what they were talking about doing in order to better deal with that scenario is essentially being really intelligent about when you show data and where. And so our phones are not particularly intelligent about when they beep at us, right? If you have email notifications turned on, you're getting email notifications, text notifications. You know, I regularly get like, you know, basically broadcast spam from a push notification from an app I downloaded months ago asking me to buy something. And we'll probably do the same thing on our app. <laughs> so it, it's right now it's very um, there's just not a lot of intelligence in that system so I think what manufacturers will start doing especially when it gets in the wrist and that becomes even less more more of a problem and less tolerable is they'll develop smarter approaches to notifications um, and my guess is they'll also not give um, as much control to individual applications as to when notifications occur um, in order to reduce some of that noise uh, but fundamentally it's, it's a human uh, sort of like dopamine response problem that isn't necessarily going to be solved by manufacturers because we want it. Um, and it's hard to say how that's going to get solved. Right? Does it just get worse and worse and worse until we can't function? I hope not. Um, but I think it's going to take a lot more sort of individual meditative effort on our side uh, in order for it to really uh, be alleviated. Bunch of questions behind you. So along those lines, besides from the distraction, if you can get all the things you can now get on your phone, but it's on your wrist, does that mean only people under 25 or 30 will be able to read it? <laughs> uh, if all of those things, and the second, part is um, 
there is something to be said for fashion. I'm sure if it's something really cool, then people don't care. But yeah. if it's not really cool and it's made out of plastic, how many people are going to want to wear it? Yeah. Well, there, so there's a big company that agrees with you big time in the fashion side of it. It's uh, Jawbone. So Jawbone, talk to those guys. They have a, you know, a wristband that has no display. It sort of looks like a piece of jewelry. It's not really jewelry, but it's fairly fashionable compared to like the basis watch, which is, you know, not so fashionable, or not, not to speak of Google Glass. Um, so their belief is that you're going to continue to wear your fashion watch, your nice watch, and then you're going to put a bracelet next to it. Um, it, it ultimately, the, the, it's a dual question. One is how much value can be provided there, and then how cool can these things be made, right? And I tend to think that those two will converge to a place where most people won't be concerned by that problem. In the beginning, most people will, right? And then over time, it'll be less and less, right? So if you think about like that big ass car phone, right? That like probably wasn't so cool to carry around unless it was a status symbol. Um, that's that's how it'll start, right? That's how it started today, right? Like it isn't actually that nice, but like people are who either find it really useful or essentially are using it to display their status. Like I'm a cool quantified selfer, or look at me, fashion, you know, tech forward, you know, entrepreneur with you know with my pebble. Right, like it'll start that way, and then as these things get more useful, which I think they rapidly will get more useful, and they get more beautiful, and you can do some you know amazing things today. I think you get even more amazing. Right, the difference between like a Motorola StarTech and an iPhone. Right, like iPhone is a fashion accessory, and I think we'll get there with smartwatches. Um, so that's sort of the second question. Backing up to the first one, um, from my perspective, the 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 interface problem. Essentially, how do you get data into these devices and how do you get data out? It's probably the biggest challenge we're going to face going from phone to wrist. Right? So Google, the Android Wear stuff, says that you should talk to it. Right? Like, hi, Google. I'd like to you know, give me directions to so-and-so. And that's a really janky interface. Right? Like, uh, voice interfaces, like, people are just not particularly comfortable using them. Um, will it work? Maybe. I don't think so. I think in a car. People will be willing to talk to it, but outside of that or their own home, I don't see that becoming a very uh, popular way of interacting. Um, so, you know, there are other ways, right? I don't know which will emerge. You know, there's a device called Mio, MYO, that um, is essentially it's a it's a sort of uh, forearm mounted device that measures the muscle movements in your fingers and can. Uh, Hasn't been released yet, but is a control and gesture interface device. So maybe we're tapping our fingers like this to do input. Um, you know, there are leap motion-like devices um, which use, um, I think it's IR, um, to um, essentially today, you, you know, it's like you hang your hands over this thing and can manipulate stuff. Maybe we're hanging our hands over this thing to manipulate it instead of tapping it. But I also think you're going to see a lot of tapping on a tiny little display. <laughs> and, like people have showed prototypes of like typing little messages on the watch and. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, it's but like people said the same thing, right? Like how many diehard BlackBerry folks were like, oh, I'm never going to type on a screen, never, 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 and now people are doing it, um, and they're doing it pretty fast. So I think we'll adjust to it pretty quickly. So I think the first generation stuff is going to be pretty weird and annoying on the interface side, and then we're going to get I don't know what technology will occur or when to to change that, but I think it'll get easier over time to interface with them. But it is going to be a big problem. So I have uh, two questions. Um, the first one is simple, which is just ads. And the, uh, the second question is sort of related, which is um, one of the things that's different about the phone you know, versus the, the wrist watch and the phone is that now you're looking at asking people to have two devices. And I think that there's a pretty small percentage of people who are comfortable with that. And do you think that that will change or that there will be a way that they'll say, you only need your watch or your watch is still your watch and you get all the data on the phone or something like that? Well, again, I'll do the second one first. Um, you know, people used to say, like, you have your you know, home computer. You know, we don't, you don't need one for every member of the family. And you have your laptop. You're not going to have a tablet. And you know, people today regularly have two laptops one tablet, a small tablet, their phone, right? <laughs> their old phone, like the devices proliferate, right? If they're valuable. So I don't think we're going to see a big problem with people not wanting to wear 
or carry both. And then as things progress, yeah, there, there I'm sure will be watch technology that starts connecting to the cellular network and, and taking over all the functions of the phone if you don't want to wear it. Um, but I think that'll take some time. Right? The, the difference in moving like a little bit of processing power, a display, and Bluetooth up here with some sensors versus also adding the cellular stuff and the you know, the Wi-Fi stuff is like, there's a big battery life difference, et cetera. So it might take a long, long, long time to, for that to happen. But, you know, we probably will see that eventually. Uh, so that's my guess. And then the other was ads. Um, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I have a good answer for that one, right? The um, people, when, when people like to have things free, you need advertising to pay for it. Uh, so, and I don't think we're going to get over our, our obsession with wanting things for free. So therefore, I think ads will follow us to the wrist, uh, just like they did to the phone and the tablet and all these other places. Hey. Um, so I, I completely hear you on Google Glass and how it's very jarring to speak to somebody wearing one. But I also think as far as the, the form factor, I think that there might be, I mean, for instance, hipster glasses being a very obvious fashion trend to point to, yep. ways to get around that. So I just wanted to hear if you think that there are other advantages that the smartwatch would have over Google, Google Glass type interfaces as a better uh, data source for the future. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I think about that. I mean, you're going to have the same, like computing power is going to be about the same, right? You're not going to be able to have something huge here and something small there, or the opposite. Um, you know, access to sensor data, um, you probably are going to be able to do as much or more on a place like the forehead uh, here as you would on the wrist. So I think from a sort of health sensor perspective, over time it could be similar. Um, although in terms of persistency, so that might be an advantage for the smartwatch, right? The 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 you're not going to wear the even if Google Glass is something you use all the time, you're not going to wear it all the time, right? Like during this lecture, you may take it off, right? When you have, uh, you know, there, there will be, I think, more instances where a smartwatch that's on your wrist is pretty likely to stay there until you take it off at night, if you even do. So I think in terms of persistency of uh, sensor data and availability of uh, display, I think smartwatch would have a, a bit of an edge. Um, you know, it's cl you know the other. I think the other an another advantage towards Google Glass is that because you have the microphone there, uh, from a data input perspective, you can do some pretty cool stuff there. It's so, like it's far better in terms of like getting information to you. Um, but those are those are just some of the trade-offs. I I just tend to think that the the social side to it is going to overwhelm any sort of small differences between the platforms, at least from a mass market perspective. Bunch of questions behind you. Uh, do you think if some company integrated like the Google Glass technology with someone's regular prescription, that because a person you know wouldn't take off their glasses, it would just be more incentive to like you know keep them on and just appeal to a wider market of people that already do wear glasses? Yeah, I, I think that people who do wear glasses are much more likely to to wear and use Google Glass. Yes, but there are still like there are still social implications to having a display here, right? If I'm going like this, you know, while I'm talking to you, <laughs> it looks very weird. It looks weird, and you know, I've, oh, I don't know what I did there, um, but it, it's just a, it's a hard it's a hard thing to overcome from my perspective. Um, All right, let me, I'm going to do a couple more slides on emotions, and then we can wrap up with a bunch of questions. Um, so, you know, all this time I've been talking about data and smartwatches and moving sort of computing power to different places, but I've sort of lost my original point, which is that none of this matters if you don't tap into the human emotional needs. And so I'm going I'm to give you a personal story about sort of my personal emotional needs um, as an example. So uh, meet the captain who's on the left and the claw who's on the right. These are sort of my pet names for two of my personalities. Um, the captain is sort of the one you see here today, right? Like I would tell you like I do inbox zero and I wake up early and I go to the gym and I do all these things and for the most part I do. 
Um, but the claw on the right often disagrees. And so you might find me, you know, on a Friday night drinking to excess. You might find me on a Saturday saying, screw going to the gym and eating a bunch of potato chips. You might find that happens for a week. Um, <laughs> right? And like, you know, and I've tried all sorts of like little tricks, right? Like little dolls with an eye and... Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, reminders and social and like at some point the claw is just like, fuck all that shit. I'm going to do what I want to do, right? And, you know, most people have some, some sort of mechanism like this. Um, I've dug into this one and I actually recently have had some revelations around it. So I'm going to go into sort of what they are for me. But it's it, more as an example for, for everyone to think about sort of how your own psychology is going to impact these types of decisions. So I used to think of the captain as the good guy and the claw as the bad guy. Right? The captain was like the right one and the claw was wrong. And all, I had to figure out how to kill the claw. Right? It was like, how do I make the claw go away, never bother me again? Right? So I can always get up early and go to the gym and I can always eat the right thing and I can always get to inbox zero. And you know, it just wasn't working. Right? So I literally, I was just like suppressing the claw until as long as possible. And then he would come on out swinging and when he came out swinging, he would swing harder and harder every time, right? It was not a, a matter of like, it, 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 was, it, was, it was an excess response, right? The longer I was good for, the longer I'd be bad for. Um, and so just swinging like up and down and up and down and up and down. And at some point, um, you know, my first realization was I'm probably not actually either of those. Those are sort of two of my different personas and I'm probably something deeper or something else. I don't know what that is, but occasionally when I get in touch with it, I'm actually neither the captain nor the claw. Um, and then I realized that someone had asked me a great question. They said, uh, tell me about some major child inf influences, either positive or negative, right? the biggest influences you have as a child. And I said, well, my mother was a great positive influence. She would tell me that I could do anything, and she would help me get into the best math classes, and she would help me write my college applications. And ultimately, like, that sort of behavior is the captain, right? I got the captain from my mother who started a business and helped me through all these challenges and always sort of pushed me forward and told me I could do all these things. Um, and the other influence I mentioned was the public school system because I hated the public school system. I was the most disruptive, angry child that you could possibly imagine. I would kick and scream about going to school. I would do disruptive things in class. I get kicked out of class. I hated it, hated it, hated it. And sometimes my mom even um, facilitated that by saying, like, you don't have to go to school today. It's a day off. It's free, you, know, you have freedom. Um, and what I realized over time is that those two influences map directly to these. Right? The, my mother and sort of pushing me forward, I can do anything, is, it's the captain and sort of like being a manager of my own life. And the claw, instead of sort of being self-destructive, is actually a freedom-seeking mechanism. Right? I, didn't, I felt like I didn't have freedom and all I wanted was to be free. Right? I wanted freedom from homework and you know, sitting in that row and homeroom and I wanted just to be free. And ultimately, like, that's part, you know, I've done some great things with that, right? Like starting my own company and you know, sort of making my own way in the world is all because I really seek freedom. But when I sort of cramp down on my own freedom by saying like, I shall do these things in this order, go to these meetings at these times, eventually the freedom seeking side of me comes out and disrupts in whatever way it needs to disrupt so that it gets me the freedom that I think that at some like deep psychological level I need. So that was all sort of very fluffy and, and interesting. Uh, but here are some startups that are actually doing some stuff about this uh, from an emotional perspective. So the first is a company called Affectiva. Affectiva um, looks, they, if you see on the right, like little dots on, on that person's face, they will map smiles and happy sounds and sad um, and they're starting to release SDKs that work both for your computer and eventually your mobile device that will get you access to your emotional state during the day and sort of while you're looking at things. So you might be able to look back and see that Facebook makes me sad while Twitter makes me happy. They probably both make you sad. Um, <laughs> and uh, what they're using this first for is the wonderful public service of advertising. <laughs> Telling advertisers when you're happy and when you're sad so they can make you happy more often so they can buy their products. Um, but nonetheless, a very interesting direction. Uh, a company called Happier, another local Boston company. Happier 
has what they sort of term as a social network around happiness. So they encourage you to share happy moments um, and be grateful for the things that you have. And when you do, the entire community of people is giving you likes and thumbs up and smiles and like making you feel like a million bucks. Um, and the reality is gratitude practice as uh, science has actually been shown to drastically increase happiness over time. So if there's one thing you want to do, come away from, from a personal development perspective, it's keep a gratitude journal or download happier or just note grateful moments sort of during every day. Um, next company is called Pavlock. This is going to be the negative side of it. I'm going to see if I can press play on this. Um, <laughs> okay, so uh, if you could press play on this, you would see that Manish, who's the entrepreneur who created Pavlock, has hired someone off Craigslist to slap him when he's not productive. <laughs> so it's a, se it's a seven second clip with him, her looking over, seeing what he's doing, which is not work, slapping him. <laughs> and you know, not surprisingly, Manisha's productivity went through the roof. And this gave him the idea to start a company called Pavlock. And you see the drawings on the, on the right for Pavlock. Pavlock is a device that locks onto your wrist. You make a commitment to a behavior. And then it shocks you if you don't do it. <laughs> um, and from my perspective, you know, this, in a very different way than Happier, is tapping into some of the same emotional signals and processing that actually get us to do stuff, right? It's, it's getting away from like push notification, you haven't reached 10,000 steps today, go walk another 4,000 steps, right? And getting more towards like real human emotion that actually drives behavior. Um, and you know, Manish in this case, it's a, it's a negative reinforcement, but I think we're gonna find positive ways to do that as well. And then last, but hopefully not least, is my company, Change Collective. So I'll go into some detail on sort of what we do. So what you see up here is uh, an example course. We're building a mobile course platform. And what we do is work with the experts who wrote the book or gave the TED Talk and are suggesting some sort of behavior change. And we build mobile courses that have content, tracking, social accountability, and really all the behavior change and quantified self tricks that you just saw to actually help you do it. So instead of picking up a diet book, reading it, um, you would pick up the course by the same author and take that course over three weeks and it would sort of help you through it. And the, the insight for doing this was that at Zio, I was building this quantified self device. And at the same time, as all these new devices were coming out, I was picking up two to three books a week and reading them on some sort of health or personal development related topic. And at some point we sort of asked ourselves like, why are we reading all these old school books? And why, when we talk to consumers, are they always mentioning these old school books and the experts they read and the blogs they love and the group that they go to? Like all of this like offline or in person or sort of like squishy stuff. And they're not really talking about the data and the tracking and all these things. And ultimately it's that when, from our perspective, when you look at the way that we changed behavior in sort of all of evolutionary history, it was through people. Right? We saw people that were emulating the behaviors and the mannerisms and had the things that we wanted, and then we followed them. Right? We, we got their help and changed our behavior. Right? So it's the old adage of the village elder helping you change behavior, and we're seeing that today in people connecting with an author who has great stories and tells a great, um, you know, and actually like draws out testimonial. And people, there's a little bit of hero worship that goes on, right? When, when someone reads a book by an expert like Deepak Chopra or Tim Ferriss or whoever their interest person is, uh, where you kind of want to be that person, you want to live that lifestyle, there's an emotional pull towards it. Content does that to us. Um, and you know, bringing real people into it as well does that to us. So what we're doing is connecting what we think is sort of the, that emotional source of great stories, great testimonials, hero worship, with sort of the hard realities of tracking reminders, social accountability, like all these like niggly things, but suddenly there's a reason to do them, right? So when, you know, Derek says, who's, uh, Derek uh, runs a company called Greatest, it's a great uh, web content brand, lots of people love him. Um, when he says like, hey, I saw you didn't work out yesterday, but you know, today you should, and here's the reason why, and there's a 15 second video clip from him, you know, with a story about someone who transformed their life, that might be when you actually do it instead of, you know, you didn't do your seven push-ups today. 
do your seven push-ups today. Uh, so that's our hope, is that we can tap into some of the emotional uh, components to change and combine those with the sort of more hardcore, quantified self, behavior change, tracking type stuff. Uh, so let's go back to Q&A. Um, and my information is there on the board if anyone wants to reach me, and I'll also be here after for a while. Yeah, two questions. Uh, one, what's the price point for this? And then two, is this mostly software based? And then where do you see kind of the comparison of like Fitstar being very software focused versus adding a trainer and kind of bringing them on board, yep. lowering that price point, retrofit, Wello, yeah. et cetera, and kind of talk about that. Yeah, sure. So uh, we think of those as two distinct movements. So on the one side, uh, folks like Fitstar and us, fundamentally what we're doing is we're taking content, so things that used to be books, blog posts, DVDs, and we're dragging their interactivity up and we're dragging all the behavior science into it so they're much more effective. Right? So if you're going to read a book or something like content anyways, let's make it actually awesome for you and actually work. Right? What Wello and uh, Rise and others are doing is they're saying, let's take a coach, which is super expensive and super effective, and let's make it less expensive and more accessible. And so do those meet in the middle some magical day, potentially? Uh, but we do think of them as separate. Uh, and the, way, the reason that we really think of them as separate is that you know, again, it comes back to emotion. When people jump into a change process, essentially the first thing they do is seek out information and read content or consume content, right? And that starts with like a web search and some web content. And if they're really interested, it soon graduates to books and you know, online videos and you know, sort of course type stuff. And only then if that either they like it or it doesn't work and they're still needing it, do they eventually graduate to getting professional help. So um, it ends up being a much smaller number of people who get there. Um, but those people are very strongly helped, and they're paying a lot of money, so it's a big market. Uh, but it, it is fundamentally different. Um, and that backs into the question on price point, which is that you know, we're pricing this like content. So it's uh, just a bit more, it's a bit more expensive than the book, essentially. Right? So if a, you know, your book might be like 10 to 20 bucks, these courses are sort of in that like 20 to $50 price range. So a little bit more expensive than the book, but way less expensive than a personal coaching intervention of any sort. Um, I wanted to ask about privacy, actually. And then I know when you were talking about the Apple Health Book um, that you know it's kind of a double-edged sword because Apple would have all that data. And of course, sharing has some of its benefits, too. Um, because you could have like social pressure for you to make positive change, yeah. but where do you draw that line between sharing and privacy? Yeah, uh, so for every person it's different, right? Fundamentally, the people are motivated by different things, right? We're all humans and there's some commonalities, but uh, you know, someone giving a talk earlier today was talking about how some, mo some users, when you give them a badge, when they lose 10 pounds, that's like amazing for them and they're gonna work for that badge, digital badge, and other people could care less about your little digital badge. Right? And that's true, as an example, with social. Right? There are people who are very private, they want to change on their own, and by the way, they're not really motivated by social pressure from their peers. And there are other people for whom change the very social process and they want to get help. So you know, from our perspective, um, privacy is something that should be in the user's control, and they should have the ability to essentially tune it up or tune it down. And that both includes how they share their personal information, it also includes how we use their personal information. So um, we haven't built all of our privacy policies yet, but we'll model them after Zio. And the way that Zio built privacy policies was that we enabled people at any time to opt out, um, and we had very strong protections in place for sort of anonymizing and using data in a way that protected your privacy. Um, and you know, we're con consistently recognized as some of the sort of innovators for letting data be open and letting you push it anywhere you want uh, from a sort of privacy security standpoint. So I think we'll follow that book. How, how are you finding uh, scaling with uh, B2B versus B2C uh, mm -hmm. in this realm? Yeah, I mean, so uh, Change Collective ends up being a bit of both. Right? So we are working with the experts. So that's a B2B challenge to get all, to all these different experts. But ultimately, the end product goes to consumers. And our brand is involved in that. It's sort of co-branded between us and the expert. So it's both. Um, you know, to date, we don't have a lot of traction on either because we haven't launched it yet. Uh, but so far, the, the B2B sales process has gone pretty well. And it's gone well because when you talk to these experts, they are 
dying to have a mobile app. That's the way they describe it. They're like, I called this development shop and I thought about this mobile app and they show you this like monster <laughs> that they were trying to create and like, because they don't know how to really build mobile products. They're great content people, tell great stories. So every single one of them wants to be on mobile. They don't know how to do it. So typically we're so far with not much competition, pretty easily able to sell on that side. Um, and then on the consumer side, we don't have a lot of data yet. We did build a course with Happier on gratitude that we did uh, just over 30K in one beta. Uh, in top line sales. So pretty strong uptake, but one course, one data point. So yet to be seen, but I tend to think that the challenge here will be the B2C side and not the B2B side. I think a lot of the B2B guys, a lot of these experts are going to want to work with us. And the question is more going to be once we produce a course with them, how do we actually sell a lot of them? Hi. Hi. For wearable technology, how are they um, monitoring like the health aspects of it? You know, like years ago, people were worried about radiation mm. from cell phones, and yeah. how are they handling that? Yeah. So, um, you know, recently Fitbit had a bunch of devices recalled uh, because of a similar issue, right? They had, uh, I believe, it was uh, some a problem with their stainless steel and it was causing rashes and allergies in a small portion of the population. So, I mean, the first line defense is consumer um, requirements for any device, right? So CE and FCC requirements, you know, there's a whole realm of regulation that says how much radiation you're allowed to output on what frequency band, in what way, and what materials are allowed to touch the skin and those are deemed as safe, and there's a, bar a barrage of testing that goes through. Um, ultimately, the question is, are those, probably the question is, are those standards the right standards? Right, so the folks who are particularly worried about um, radio wave challenges believe that the standards are, you know, written poorly and that that stuff is actually damaging us even though it's legal. And, you know, it's a bit of an open question, right? As a society, we seem to have decided that it's worth the potential downstream health implication as a trade-off. Whether it is or not, I think is unknown and you can sort of argue either side of that coin. So from my perspective, it's sort of a carryover from one to the other. Uh, but it doesn't actually change. It. I don't think the problem gets a lot worse with a wearable because the, the big radios are still going to be in your phone for a while, right? the cellular radios. And you know, on your wrist is going to be this tiny little Bluetooth transmitter that's a thousandth of the power output of your cell phone. So you know, it's something to continue watching. but. Um, I don't think the smartwatches really substantially changed the equation. And that Google Glass? Yeah. Yeah, so um, again, the question is amount of radiation and what you believe is safe. Right? So there, there are people who uh, would never use Google Glass because of that. Right? There are folks who recommend that before using a cell phone that you use an earpiece you know, with a wire that separates you from the radiation. And there are some studies that show that if you do this, Right, that there are changes in your brain. And there are other studies that show there aren't any. So I don't know. I mean, like, I just don't know. And, but you still end up with the, the same channels. Like Zio had a transmitter on, right in the forehead. Right? And we were transmitting you know, a tiny, 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 tiny bit of power compared to the phone. And we were expecting that to be a worry for people. Didn't, wasn't, no one ever complained. No, you know, very few people didn't buy it for that reason, right? They, did, they didn't buy it because they didn't want to wear a headband, not because the headband was transmitting. Um, but there were people, like uh, there's a, a guy, Dr. Mercola, who has an alternative health website, who said, I would love to endorse your product as long as it doesn't transmit on the head. If you can give me a version that doesn't do that, I will, I'd love your product, but I believe it's dangerous. So hard to say. I want to go back to the uh, question of uh, having a watch and a phone at the same time. I know that you said that uh, you think it's not an issue, uh, but the fact of the matter is that because of the iPhone, many people stop uh, wearing watches at all. So you don't have one, I don't have one, and probably most a lot of others here. Um, so the uh, the uh, you know the motivation to actually put back a watch is because it adds something. Yep. Right. So, uh, so I understand the the point of the uh, all the sensor-related 
functionality and everything you can build on top of that. I'm curious whether you have any thoughts about additional type of add value that the smartwatches can bring to the game without having the cell phone part of the uh, watch itself. Yeah, so I think that notifications are huge. Um, so I've, I've worn a Pebble for a long period of time and notification on meeting was huge. Right? Like I didn't miss meetings because my watch buzzed and I looked down and it was like, oh, next meeting, cool. We've only got 10 minutes because right, versus my phone that's in my pocket on silent mode. So vibration uh, for notifications, sort of glance notifications on calendar stuff, on email, on you know, any sort of social communication stuff. Again, you run into that problem of like overload and barrage. Right? If you can solve that a bit by triaging such that only the right messages get to the wrist, I think the notification side to it is going to be important. Um, I think there's an aspect of discoverability that because it's a little more personal to you, you, you enable. Um, so you know, if your phone's in your pocket and you know, let's say you have a list of places that you love and you want to, you want to visit, right? Here are the places I want to visit. And you're walking by one right, unknowingly, right? If your phone buzzes and you have to take it out and look, it's, 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 a, it's kind of a clunky experience versus you know, your, your watch buzzing. Right. I think there's a lot of social stuff that can be done there. So, you know, I also just don't know. Right? Like, we're going to have to see. I think a lot of cool stuff is going to come up, um, but the health stuff is going to be pretty, I think it's going to lead the way in terms of, like, the most obvious difference in value add. But then we're going to see a bunch of stuff that we never expected. Is that a question? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your business model and uh, who will be doing the marketing? Is it uh, the uh, change collective or uh, the content developer? Yeah, so the business model today, and you know, it may change, is uh, we find an expert who has you know, a certain level of quality in their advice and is really well regarded in the field and has some sort of audience that they've built. We work with them for free to develop the course, so we're sort of taking most of the burden of writing a lot of the material, bringing the video crew out, they're helping, but we're sort of shouldering the burden on it. Then when we've created a course, we both market it. Um, in the early days, I think we expect the experts to bring a good portion of our audience. And then over time, as we sort of get that flywheel going, we expect to be able to bring a big audience as well, so that they get the benefit not only of their audience, but of our larger audience as well. So it ends up being both. And then the business model is we charge the consumers for the courses, 20 to 50 bucks, and then we rev share back to the expert a percentage of that. And that depends on a couple of factors, but it's a pretty healthy percentage, um, which both is a way for them to monetize their content, but it also incents them to help us market the product. Hi, my question is more on the behavioral side. So you said uh, to, 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 to create habits, you need to use the two or three months period that people has like the inner motivation with the best experience possible. What's the best experience? It's like to have uh, the social interaction, is to have positive feedback, is to, you know, to yeah. know that I have one more day of life expectancy because I'm healthier today. Yeah. So what, what, what makes this better you know, experience? What yeah. do you see? So uh, my answer is going to be a total cop out, um, but you know, there's lots of research that I haven't done. I'm not a you know a behavioral scientist um, that shows what impacts motivation in every single area, right? So like, you know, should you give someone a marshmallow in this case, or should you give them a word of praise? And like, you can find studies that will tell you in all sorts of circumstances exactly what happens. If we're really complicated humans and we're all different. You know, I, I have a friend who I've been trying to pick apart his brain for years, but literally, like, when he wants to do something, he just does it. Motivation is not an issue, literally not an issue. Like, he can just decide to do something. And so one day he woke up and decided that uh, he didn't want to drink until he completed an Ironman triathlete. And he hasn't had a drink of alcohol in over two years without any effort. He, and, and like, you know, when I make a choice like that to deny myself something, when I see that thing, there's effort in refusing it, right? Like, there's cake. I can't eat cake. Ooh, I want cake. Right? <laughs> he doesn't have any of that. Like, it's just like, no, he's just like, no, I made the decision, so there's no question. Um, and, you know, different people are motivated by different triggers. So, you know, ultimately, I think 
we're, vi we're still very nascent in terms of our understanding of behavior change and what drives it. Um, and the state of the art as we advance is going to be taking sort of this massive research that shows like in this circumstance with college students with this type of thing, this thing happened, and not generalizing it to a population, but instead building really individual solutions that enable you to target for this person at this moment, this is probably the right intervention. And we're really far away from having anything that really does that. But to me, that would be the most powerful and it's something that if you know, we're working towards along with others, I think it's gonna make a big impact. Uh, so the folks that we've seen that need solutions like this the most are the ones that are at greatest risk for chronic disease, that tend to be yep. the baby boomer generation, and also are not as tech savvy in uh, purchasing the, you know, the activity trackers and whatnot. Have you found ways to resonate with them and get them to, to adopt these sort of solutions more quickly? I don't think they're going to. You know, I mean, it's a big problem. Like, I know lots of people who are working on it, but fundamentally, there's, there, there are bigger issues, right? If someone is overweight, diabetic, depressed, right? Their last worry is about putting on a fitness, you know, it's just like, here are the incentives for you to go to the gym. You're not gonna die as soon, you're gonna be happier, you're gonna have, you know, a better sex life. Like, you can list the benefits all day long, right? Like, <laughs> it's, there's not, it's not a problem of motivation, right? It's not that like, oh, these people aren't motivated, what they really need is a fitness tracker to help motivate them. You know, from my perspective, it's structural issues in the way that like we've organized society, right? It's the food that we're eating and the chronic stress that we're under and the environment that we're in and the light exposure that we get and that we don't get. It's these really structural issues that lead to, you know, our bodies, which are not designed for those, reacting very poorly. And then once you're off the rails, you're off the rails, right? And you're not going to come back on the rails or you're unlikely to come back on the rails through interventions like this. It's more likely to take um, you know, really intensive change processes. So, you know, from my perspective, if, if you hired me to go solve those big problems, which is, it's not the thing that I do, right? I, I help, we, we're tending to help people who are already interested in helping themselves. Um, I would look at the bigger structural issues, right? The big nutrition issues, light exposure issues, access to education issues, poverty, like those big structural issues and like, I don't have a solution for those either, but I don't, I don't think that this world is gonna offer much opportunity for that. Because if, if, if someone is not taking like the, the really um, low hanging fruit already, then giving them layers of analysis on top of it, I don't think it's gonna make a big difference. I, uh, I know that uh, medical expense is, uh, is uh, very large like in this country. But uh, it seems this uh, health fitness apps uh, don't have too many users. I wonder if human nature decided uh, that uh, people usually wait until problems hmm. happens. Uh, and so, so I wonder if health uh, fitness is indeed a, a, a small market, uh, I mean, even in the future. Yeah. So what, 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 well, the, the business. Uh, yeah, I mean, so right, the med the medical industry is a, a a fifth of the economy, right? So it's I don't know what the numbers are, but huge. And health and wellness is smaller, but it's still it's like hundred billion dollar industry stopped on top of other hundred billion dollar industries, right? Like the weight loss industry is a sixty billion dollar industry, and the fitness industry is similar sized. And then you've got sleep and stress, and so they are big industries. But you're right, they're not big in comparison to all of healthcare. So, uh, you know, ultimately I think the, the yeah, the, the, the question is whether we're sort of programmed to get sick and then get help versus be proactive about it. Um, and I don't, I don't know, th there's, there's two sides to that. Like I'm, I'm trying to present a, a positive one. Right? The negative one is, yeah, you're right, People don't give a shit and they're gonna you know, get sick and die. Um, I think the more positive one is similar to what we were just talking about is, I think that a lot, of, a lot of it is just structural issues around how our society operates and that the intrinsic human interest and need to improve yourself, to be healthy, to be happy, to have great relationships, to leave a great legacy to the world, like 
I think that's intrinsic. I think everyone truly deeply wants that. Um, but that's not necessarily true with everyone at all times and the way that we've structured our society. It's not true for as many of us as we'd like. So it's a really roundabout way of answering it, but I think there's hope that we can turn more people towards health and wellness um, before sort of hitting a, a problem in their life. First and last. So I work in a biobehavioral lab, so I, I have some understanding of the benefits of measuring things like galvanic skin response. Um, and so as devices are, are getting better at measuring things like emotional arousal, do you see the Change Collective as at any point being a platform for some of these devices in their collective um, to, for users essentially to um, seek their data to be able to be in, uh, sort of plugged into this for their coursework, essentially. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so that, I mean, our, our goal, we plug in whatever data source is best for the scenario at hand, right? So it could be simple, like I did the workout, I didn't do the workout. Um, we're gonna start integrated fitness trackers, right? There are experts who say you should walk more, and why not tap into a M7 coprocessor to do that? And as an example, if there was a way to measure happiness and gratitude, right now. You could believe it would be integ integrated into the Everyday Grateful course. So as sensor technology improves, our experts are going to be really interested in including those sensors as part of their courses. And so will consumers.